Hello everybody, welcome to the Geofiles. <laughs> the first couple minutes you're going to see me spin this. This is a broken geode that my neighbors found yesterday, March 8, 2020, in a creek in west central Indiana. And geodes in Indiana are pretty common, especially the further south you go. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use this as an example because I'm going to, I've done this partially before with like igneous rocks and stuff for rock identification here, here in the lab. But this time I'm going to walk you through the process in detail just to show you how we identify minerals and rocks with, you know, every, not everyday equipment, but relatively inexpensive equipment and that's what i'm going to be using here is stuff that you can buy online for relatively cheap or or in a geo kit something like that to do these tests and for some reason the highway out there is really loud today but anyway so you look at this here and as you can see just for scale the widest part of my thumb is about 0.9 inches which i believe is 2.3 centimeters in width so you can see this is a decent this is a decent sized chunk with good crystal development in it doing this quite often and knowing where this came from i pretty much had it down to two possible minerals right off the bat but i'm going to step back a bit step back and take you through the process in a little more detail when i do this it wasn't the original one of the two i thought it was the second one, but it's still cool. And I have already done some tests on it, but I'm going to redo them here and show them to you. Some tests I will not show in detail because I don't have a close mount for my phone to do this. But anyway, let's get started here, and I hope you got a real good look at this. So let's get started. So we have our sample that I just showed you in great detail what how can we narrow our focus because there's like 5,000 different minerals out there obviously we can't go through all of them it's not efficient it's it's impractical so how do we get started first we need to narrow or limit our possibilities how do we do that well this came from west central indiana in a creek bed now obviously this is not a geode in glacial Diamictin. Diamictin doesn't form these type of things, so it came from the bedrock. So we can consult a geologic bedrock map of the area, if there is any, in a lot of the glaciated states like Illinois, Indiana, south, southern part of Wisconsin, Iowa. A lot of times bedrock maps aren't available because it's buried so deep. But you can find a generalized map, and you'll find that most everything in that area is going to be a sedimentary it's going to be Paleozoic, and it's going to either be a clastic or a carbonate rock, okay? Clastic rocks are things like sandstones, and shales, siltstones, mudstones, things like that. Carbonates are gonna be your limestones and your dolostones mainly. Well, we look at this rock. What are the main constituents of clastic rocks and carbonates. Well, clastic rocks, if you have a sandstone, a quartz aronite, which is really common in the Paleozoic in the Midwest, your major constituent is going to be quartz. Now, granted, the quartz has been mechanically weathered down into grains, but it's still mostly quartz. Another major component of clastic rocks are in sandstones and and other things are feldspars and now this is a whole group of minerals but we can eliminate this because our kosic or feldspar rich sandstones and mudstones are not common here but we do have clays which form unlike sand and silt which is broken down mechanically weathered rock Clays form from the alteration of minerals. This probably wasn't derived from any sort of shale or clay. That's a safe bet. So we don't have to worry about any clay minerals. Let's get into our carbonates. And our carbonates can be deposited biologically 
or inorganically. They don't have to be shells of dead things because we have Precambrian carbonates. And I'm not going to talk about evaporites, which are another kind of chemical rock. We can rule them out automatically here because, you know, you lick the rock. You don't taste any salt. You don't taste any anything like that. Gypsum, gypsum, which doesn't really have a taste, isn't really an option. You can tell by looking at it. I'll get into that later, that when we get into crystal formations, that gypsum doesn't form these type of crystals. So we can eliminate those type of chemical rocks. But our carbonates, we have limestones, which are made mostly of calcite. And we have adolostones, which are basically made of dolomite. Now, although rarer, but not out of the realm of possibility, because in that area of Indiana, we have things like coal in the Pennsylvanian. Although that is an organically derived rock, a mineral commonly associated with that, which is also a carbonate, is called siderite. It's an iron carbonate, and you'll see it here when I show you the papers. I'm not going to present you any slides. I'm going to hold the papers up here. But we'll go through all these in a few minutes here. So we have right now our possibilities are siderite. We can't rule out dolomite. We can't rule out calcite. And we can't rule out quartz. Are there any other possibilities? When doing this, you should try to come up with as many as you can Okay, so we can't rule out any of these. Is there another one, maybe, a, or one or two more that we can't rule out? And when you're doing this, you generally want to keep, you want to have five to ten possible minerals, if it is possible. Sometimes something's blatantly obvious what it is. You might have, you know, two possibilities at the most. But this case, I'm going to give you a fifth one. Uh, I think these four are enough. But there is a small chance, a very small prob probability, that we have another carbonate here called rhodochrosite. I believe that's how you spell it. Well, we are going to take that one. And although extremely rare in this state, it has been known to occur. And it generally is pink, but it can be brown. I'm going to organize this into a chart, show you what kind of tests we can do, and I'm going to show you the mineral data for each of these minerals so we can narrow this down a little more. Okay, so I've put my five possibilities up here for you on this chart. Now, there are some unique properties of some of these which are blatantly obvious because we're going to take that rock again and put the blatantly obvious observations right over here. But before I do that, I just want to say calcite is a carbonate. You know, I've already told you that, CaCO3. It is, here's the mineral data, and we are going to go through the highlighted areas. See, these are available online, and they give us some basic parameters of tests we can run. Now, we're not going to come back to these until we have run our tests. It helps minimize bias. So, you have calcite, which is in the calcite group. You have dolomite, which is carbonate with a lot of magnesium in it all right so you have that right there you have the odd man out this one is not a carbonate rock you have quartz it's sio2 so this is your only non-carbonate on this list and why is it in here with the carbonates well it's extremely common in the area and it also forms hexagonal crystals as do all these other ones okay now we have rhodochrosite. I just abbreviated rhodo. I guess I could have wrote crosite under it. But it is also a carbonate. Here's some information on it. It's a, it has manganese in it. And this plus two up here, and we're going to come back to that, okay, when we start doing our tests. Okay, so there's that one. And the last one, siderite, is a carbonate, but it's an iron carbonate and it's often brown all right so we take this rock and you know this is a video from a phone with a lot of light my color vision is really good the phones is not as good as mine although the camera will 
often get color very well. It's not always perfect, and you're going to see that when, when I do the fluorescent light, the UV light test. But by looking at this, that's why I'm trying to get as much light on it as possible, you can tell it's brown with a slight purplish tint to it. And when you move it around a little bit, it's dominantly brown, but it, it, it's iridescent. It, it, it looks, it gets slightly purplish as you move it in and out of the light, of the fluorescent light. That is, can be one of our tests iridescent and we'll come back to that in a second but you also notice it's brown now I said all of these form hexagonal crystals but you look at these these are not prismatic hexagonal crystals doesn't mean they're not hexagonal it just means they don't form prisms and you look at this carefully and I've done this many times with multiple magnifications. I mean, I've got some really high-powered optical magnification abilities here. This is twinned, and I'm going to cover that here in a little bit. And that is going to come up huge as well, okay? So those are our three basic observations. Wait, there's one more we can make. If you look from where it's white to where it becomes brown in color, under magnification, you can tell the crystals are gradational. The color is gradational, okay? It's not a sharp contact. So a tentative hypothesis we can make is we could say the, the white host rock of the geode, I'm just gonna say HR, host rock, is the same mineral as the brown, that these two are possibly the same mineral. You might say, well, how can, how can minerals be such two drastic colors? And actually, unless you've looked at a lot of minerals, and especially even amateurs, you'd start to notice really quick that, especially this group of, well, these three in particular, can have be just about any color, right? Uh, even black, smoky quartz, purple amethyst for quartz, you know, stuff like that. So any color is fair game pretty much for those three. Quick note, fluoride is not up here, and that is a slight possibility, but I ruled it out right away. It is incorrect crystal. It doesn't form these type of crystals, so it's a non-option. The color and the iridescence is, but it's a non-option. One more observation real quick. The crystals, the brown crystals, are opaque. Okay, so I moved those up here to this column we are going to call these properties so those are our five or four basic that fifth one the white being the same mineral we're going that we're going to discover whether that is correct or not as we run these tests so i left it off so these four main ones here now when you're doing this you have to find a mineral that fits all of your observations it has to f fit everything okay and you could have two of these <laughs> that have all of these characteristics. And honestly, at that point, it, without detailed thin sections and petrographic analysis, it's a best guess at that point. Okay? But we aren't going to have that problem here. Well, I'm using also using common uh, things that people are aware of, like opaque. We all know what that means. Uh, you also have translucent and transparent. But... It's clearly opaque. Calcite is opaque, can be, doesn't always have to be. Dolomite, quartz, and rhodor quartzite are all opaque. I couldn't find anything in the literature saying siderite was opaque. Now, it could possibly if it had enough impurities in it, but we don't know that. We're just going off of basal, base observations. Iridescence. What can be iridescent? This was a little harder to track down. It's not on those basal mineral sheets, but basically calcite, dolomite, rhodocortzite, and siderite can be iridescent. Uh, I found one thing that said quartz can be, although I've never seen quartz act iridescent, so I'm leaving it off. 
brown. Every single one of these, except Roto Quartzite. Although it can be, yeah, how does it put it? It puts it as a cinnamon brown. Now in geology, we try not to use words like cinnamon, but I'm assuming that means reddish brown. This clearly is not, so it's not that. Twinning, almost every one of these. Calcite, it's really common, dolomite. Quartz can twin, or the quartzite can twin. Siderite, that's my on the fence symbol. It's an X, not really, could be. Siderite rarely twins, but it is possible. And this was one of my top two contenders when I looked at it. And I'm not going to tell you what the other one was, but when I first looked at this, this was one of the two that popped in my mind. But as you can see, it's getting kind of meh. See, so we don't... Quartz here, quartz doesn't... Or roto quartzite isn't there. And actually, since it rarely twins, we'll just say it doesn't. So Siderite has two strikes. roto quartzite has one at this point, and so does quartz. So we're narrowing the field pretty quickly, but casual hand observations can be somewhat misleading. So for right now, I'm not gonna get rid of any of these, all right? I'm going to confirm or I'm gonna verify or you know refute what some of these can be because there are more detailed tests I'm gonna do here other than go, oh yeah, that's that, okay? And we're gonna get into that here and I'm going to write a couple more tests I'm going to do here down, and then I'll probably have to we'll do some elimination at that point, and then I'm probably going to have to wipe the board for the rest of the tests. Okay, you can see we have long wave UV, cold HCL, and scratch. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the long wave UV, and I'm going to use my kind of mid-range UV flashlight here. I do have my big box one I'm not going to use. This one's around 360 nanometers, I believe. Uh, the UV violet border, I believe, is 400. So it's it's well, it's within the UV pretty solidly, but it's still long wave. So that's what I will be using. There's only a few of these minerals that fluoresce. Siderite doesn't fluoresce at all. So if we get a fluorescence, siderite's pretty much out. That's strike three for for siderite. And rhodochrosite also doesn't fluoresce. Now, there is always the small, very rare possibility that there are activator elements in here in these that will cause a fluorescation. And is that even a word? Was it a word? But anyway, <laughs> but but that's extremely rare. We're, we're trying to eliminate, we're not going to even deal with extremely rare, isolated outlier situations. Okay, so there are two that are most likely to fluoresce, calcite, and here you can see the colors and the wavelengths associated with those colors, and you can see calcite, <laughs> calcite's one big fluorescing monster, it just fluoresces and fluoresces, and just to show you here, this are, these are some pictures of calcite fluorescing, there's other data here. There's the chart that shows you intensity versus wavelength. Some other basic information. And here is the website I pulled this from. All right, and the date, which is today. And let's get to quartz. It's from the same website, but obviously a different link. Quartz also fluoresces, but we don't have the monster <laughs> fluorescence that we do with calcite all right so those are basically the colors you're going to see and this doesn't this is nowhere near as long it doesn't have as many cool pictures all right so quartz is going to look more like that you should chart and this is basically where i pulled it from with the date okay you see cold HCL, what does that mean? Well, I buy muriatic acid from the hardware store and I dilute it to three and a half percent 
and 10 to 15. There's a reason for that. Calcite, if something is almost pure calcite and you drop the weak HCl on it, it's going to go crazy. It's going to fizz. It's going to bubble. It's going to make noise. But for more rocks with more, you know, like manganese in them, dolomitic rocks or siderite, you might need something that has a higher acid concentration to get that fizz. And in my rock ID books, I get in great detail on the different types of fizzes and stuff like that, but we're not going to go into that here. Okay, to fluoresce or not to fluoresce? That is the question. Let's turn the lights out. So we'll see there's some light and hopefully this will work. Okay, can you see it? I remember this is, was a dark brown or brown, any chocolate brown, I guess you could call it. You see those little purple dots in there? I don't know if you can see them. That's dust and particles from the air. That's not the rock, but you see the rock. You can't really see it well on the video. Let me try to move this a little bit for here, away from that backlight. But you look at it here and you see it fluoresces really good as a pale yellow. So our fluorescent color is a pale yellow. It does fluoresce. If it didn't, it would look like it does with the light off. So which of these fluoresce light yellow or pale yellow? Well, you saw the charts under the long wave UV, pretty much this. Quartz has a yellow, but it's a bright yellow. That was not a bright yellow. It was a dull, pale, or light yellow. Closer, kind of like mixed with white a little and like I said you, 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 it doesn't show up as well as it does with the naked eye but actually the camera did pretty good I was pleasantly impressed so long wave UV even though some of these others do well siderite doesn't so the fact that it fluoresced that's strike three and siderite is now out I think we're done I mean you don't have to do three strikes if you're not confident you can do all the tests but Siderite's out, and like I said, that was one of my first two guesses, so even I'm not perfect at this. But the only one that does the light pale or dull yellow, whatever you want to call it, is calcite. Quartz does the bright yellow. These two also fluoresce, but they don't fluoresce that color, so we can do that. All right, let's go to cold HCl. Okay, so here we are. First, we are going to do the low concentration, and if it fizzes like crazy, and I'm going to make a prediction that it will, because at this point I pretty much know what it is. We won't do the 10 to 15. So we are going to put a little bit on the actual, see it? You can hear it too. See? That's a good hydrochloric acid reaction. Now let's do this part and this other looking part here. The white also fizzes like crazy in this bottom shell. The bottom shell does not. So we do have a third part to this geode. It is more than likely these two are the same mineral. That is a different mineral. I am not going to do the 10 to 15 percent because it fizzes like crazy. All that's going to do is to actually start dissolving the rock and I don't want to do that because this is my neighbor's specimen and I promise to give it back to them in one piece. Okay, so we have done our HCL test. And the only one that is going to fizz like crazy like that, well, there is another one, but he's gone now, is calcite. Dolomite isn't going to fizz like that with that low concentration, but it will with the 10 to 15. Quartz does not fizz at all. And rhodochordsite fizzes, but not quite that strongly. And remember, both the brown and the white that the brown sits on fizz. So we're starting to narrow the playing field even further. 
And we have another strike three. We actually have two strike threes. And for the purpose of this demonstration, that's what we're going to stick with. So here we have strike three, and here we have strike three. Now, if I was not experienced with doing this, I would not stop here. I would keep going with those until I had all the tests done. But for your sanity and mine, we are just going to keep it at the three strikes. So now we are essentially down to two. So our next test is a scratch test. Scratch plates. Basically, unfinished porcelain, white and black. Why do you want two colors? Well, minerals, regardless of their color, okay, even ones that have be red, orange, yellow, green, blue, purple, brown, black, gray, it doesn't matter, their streak is the mineral color in powdered form, and it is always one color or a slight range. Like, when I say slight range, I mean like yellowish green to greenish yellow. I don't mean like gray to orange, okay? Not that type of range, okay? It's, the, it's a subtle little range. Now, you can have no streak, and some things have no streak, but if my streak is white, which is really common for minerals, I'm gonna need something a little darker, all right? And this is more of a confirmation test. I'm not gonna eliminate either of these here because both of these have a white streak, but I wanna show you the process. Okay, so when you do this, you want to make sure you're streaking the actual mineral itself. And this is going to be hard to do with one hand, but I have good crystal points here and stuff like that. So you just need to... Ah, I don't see anything. Oh, it either has no streak or streak is white. Let's try again. You don't want to press too, too hard. So you mess it. Ah, we have a white streak. All right. And I'm just going to streak the bottom here because we have that other odd mineral. Nothing there. That also streaks white, but it didn't fizz. So it can't be calcite or dolomite. But this bottom, I'm just going to tell you what the bottom is now because we're just basically classifying this and this. It's quartz. All right. The, the shell of this geode was quartz. All right. And I, yes, I eliminated it on the chart, but I only eliminated it for this too, mostly this. So we have a white streak. All right, and I already told you, both of them, their streak scratches something else. Sorry. Both have white streaks, and they both streak white, so we cannot eliminate either. Okay. Um, sorry, I didn't write streak here. I wrote scratch and forgot to write streak, but I caught it. Now we are going to get into the scratch test. And I'm actually going to do this for the bottom of it as well that, we already, that I already told you is quartz just to show you how quartz streaks and how I can confirm that. This kit, you can get these actually from a mineral place online, or you can go to the hardware store and get a concrete tester, scratch tester kit, because it's gonna be the exact same thing. The only difference is, the price is even very similar, the only difference is this comes with more information. You've got a magnet here, you've got this stuff here, and I'm not gonna do a magnetic test because We've already ruled out siderite, and siderite isn't magnetic really anyway, but it does have iron in it. But So it could pull a little, theoretically, but it won't. So we're not going to do a magnetic test at all. But anyway, what are these? You see these here. see numbers on them. I've used these before in videos. One on each end. Each one of these points has a different hardness, and the number corresponds to Mohs hardness scale. It doesn't have a one and it doesn't have a 10 because one is so soft, the tip would not survive. It would just fall apart. And 10 is expensive because it's diamond. But you do have a plastic for two, like if you have something like a talc or something, it would tear right through it or close to it. Uh, this is copper, okay, it's pure copper. So. Yeah, those are the two softest, and at the upper end, you have very strong metals. Now, there are everyday things you can use to do a scratch test, but you can't have the full range. It won't give you eight. You, know, you won't have a two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight on the most hardness. You won't be able to do that. The uh, best you can uh, hope for is a range. So if you can, if you really want to do something like this, I suggest spending 100 bucks on the kit and getting it. Or you can use things like your fingernail, a copper penny, 
America, that's pre-1982, uh, an iron nail and other things. You can go online and find out what those things are at what the most hardness they are. And you can do it that way as well. Okay, we are going to move to this paper chart that I never used because I don't want to erase that yet. Now we're going to do, I have it on there as a scratch test, also hardness test based off Mohs hardness scale. The numbers on those tools correspond to the numbers in the hardness scale. Mohs hardness scale is a 0 through 10 scale like the Richter scale is, is but other than that, the similarities end. Okay, Mohs scale has defining minerals, minerals that define that hardness at that number. Calcite is 3, quartz is a 7, dolomite is in between. It is not a defining mineral. I'm going to organize a chart here for you that I would normally put in my field notes to show you how I would enter this and how I test to get a number. Because I want an actual value here. I don't just want this to be a qualitative scratch. I want a quantitative analysis as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick the ones close to calcite and dolomite like the three for sure. I'm going to put quartz off to the side. We're going to use a diff different um, tools for that. So it's going to be off. So we're going to do calcite, dolomite, and quartz, which will be off to the side just for that bottom so I can show you that bottom shell is quartz. Think of it as an eggshell, I guess. <laughs> Calcite's a three. Across the top here. Okay. I'm definitely going to use a number three okay I'm also going to use the one below that just kind of as a check all right so I'm going to use a two and I'm going to go one above sometimes if I really like if it's a mineral within a rock I might have a whole bunch of these all right but I'm just going to do that because dolomite and calcite are both between two and four I might want to do a five just in case, but I don't think it's necessary for this, okay? So I know what my minerals are, but when I do this in the lab book, I don't usually know what they are, the minerals. So I'll use a defining property like color, okay? Just as a placeholder. And in this case, we have brown. So we're going to put this here, and we're going to have our defining on here, our defining we have brown, we have our white base, which is right under, it's what the brown crystals sit upon, and then we have our shell, that I'm calling it, which is also white, which is our quartz, and I'm going to, no, let's do six, seven, and eight. Because quartz is right in the middle at 7. That's a defining mineral. Alright, so that's the numbers we're going to use. Our Mohs. Those are our Mohs tool numbers. The number 2 on the Mohs hardness scale is the number 2 on our tool. The number 3 on the Mohs hardness scale is the number 3 on our tool. Etc, etc. From there, what do I do? Well, I usually assign as a scratch depth, if you will, all right? Well, what do I mean by that? Well, I'll give it a number, because like I said, I want to get a quantitative average of this. So I'll have a zero, which equals no scratch. That's what I'm going to start writing in here. When you see these numbers, they do not correspond to the most hardness scale. It corresponds to this, all right? Uh, one will equal a minor scratch. It barely scratches it. And I can have in-betweens, all right? Like I can have something in between a minor, and it's largely interpretive if you read in between the lines. We should try to give it a solid number. Uh, you know, moderate, moderate is what it is, all right? If I get a moderate scratch, I know it's that number, but I'm still trying to take an average. What that can help you do is if you have no clue what it is and you use more of these, it can really help narrow the mineralogy down or it can tell you if there's a lot of impurities in it, if it's a known mineral. Because impurities, like if there's a lot of iron in this, it's going to kick, you know, if I have a siderite, it's going to have a, it's going to be harder because there's a lot of iron in it, all right? Actually, iron in and of itself isn't hard, but it's harder than this stuff, 
Okay, so, and I have a number three for a deep scratch and a number four for a very deep scratch. Basically, it just gouges right into it. Okay, so I'm not going to show you the process because I need two hands for this. I'll just show you the results. Okay, so here are my scratch test results. I did have a couple in between, so I had to do that because I got too close to the edge and you couldn't differentiate the, those numbers. But for our outer shell, for our white, we get a 1, a 2.5, and a 3. I'm going to average these numbers. Basically, I'm just going to add them up and divide by how many I used. And I will get a number, and I will show that to you here in a second. But I just want to say the brown, I got a 1.5. It wasn't quite moderate, but it wasn't a minor scratch either. Uh, so... What happens here is that it clues us in that there might be some impurities in it that could either lower the hardness or raise the hardness. That's why we do a bracketing. And normally I would do, as you can see here, I would do at least five, all right? But for the sake of demonstration, and like I said, I, I pretty much know what it is at this point, I'm just gonna do those three, all right? So let's take the average and see what we get. Okay, so I took the mean averages of these. Like for quartz, I just added one to two and a half, added that to three, divided it by three, because I have, I used three different scales. Same process over here. For the quartz, I got 2.2. What's that mean? Well, since two is moderate and that differs defines what it is like if I get a moderate scratch it pretty much means it's that mineral especially if it's a defining mineral we're real close to that we have 2.2 so there's probably some impurity in it making it a little harder but 2.2 is real close to that too so our hardness is slightly higher than a 7 so we know that this is quartz okay we just confirmed that so our shell white equals quartz. Now our white base and our brown, okay? I got two for the white base and I could have stopped there. And if I would have gotten a three and a half or four here, it would have pulled this closer to a two. Uh, same thing with this, but as you can see, I got one and a half and a 1.7. I will, when I actually enter it into my book, my lab book, I will likely do number five as well and possibly a six you know but anyway for these purposes we get in between a two and a three for hardness because we have a 1.5 and a 1.7 a two would have meant we had a three but we are at two and a half or greater you know we're closer to the three than we are the two so it doesn't rule out calcite at all However, as you can see here, dolomite is equal to three and a half to four on the Mohs hardness scale. I got that directly from my data sheet here. <laughs> so I got, this, I got that directly from my data sheet here. The hardness, it is right there, three and a half to four. So we can rule out dolomite for this test. So, we have calcite as a contender. Okay, so we are back at our dry erase board. And our scratch or hardness test, calcite is a go. Dolomite is not. That is our strike three on dolomite. So we have done this. We have eliminated those four, and we're pretty confident it's calcite. Are there any other tests we can do? There is one more I'm going to do, and I'm going to have to erase all this and just go with calcite because it's a density test I mentioned in the beginning. I am going to just run the test. I will show you how it's done. I've done this before, but I'll do it again for this particular episode. Can we do a verification test to see if this is actually calcite? Yes, we can, and I mentioned it. It's a density test. That's what we're going to run here. Now, something like this could theoretically bring something else back into the running, but I guarantee you it's not going to. Well, how do we know what the density of rocks are? Well, in here, something like this in the calcite, we have measured and calculated 
I'm going to work with the measured density. And the density, which the symbol is, I draw my rows like that, of calcite, so the density of calcite is about 2.7102 grams per centimeter cubed. All right, and dolomite is higher. But we've already eliminated dolomite, so this may could bring it back in, but I doubt it. It's going to. It has a measured of 2.86. And I calculated a 2.876. So our density for dolomite, remember I am using the measured, not the calculated. We have 2.86 grams per centimeter cubed. And some of these, and there's likely a zero here, for some reason they tend to drop significant figures. But if you see a fourth one, it means we have a lot more data for it. This one was probably calculated or averaged to a zero, and it just dropped it. So we're going to use that as our density of dolomite. You can see it's a little higher. Okay. Well, how do we calculate density? Well, first you're going to need a set of tools to do this, a set of equipment to do this. Okay. So the equipment I'm going to need to run a density test is basically my scale, which is in grams. We'll tear that out. Countertop is pretty level. I'm going to use graduated cylinders and water to get the displacement. My temperature is about 15 and a half degrees Celsius right now. Now, since these are plastic graduated cylinders, it can be messed with, but generally my experience is, you know, it's not that big of an issue, especially since I'm within four and a half degrees of STP anyway, so I don't foresee it being a problem. I am going to weigh this real quick for you, then I'm going to explain how the testers run. The mass, I'm going to get my mass, which is not going to change. I have 189, are you done? 189.4 grams. So my mass is equal to 189.4 grams. And density is equal to mass over volume all right our volume we are going to use metric because i'm going to show you a nice little beautiful trick here our volume is in centimeters cubed but our graduated cylinders are in milliliters so there's probably some weird conversion right no one cubic centimeter Okay, so one cubic centimeter, let's just do that. One cubic centimeter is equal to one milliliter at STP. I just have to swap units when I measure. I'm going to measure milliliters, and I'm just going to substitute ml for centimeters cubed when I actually record it. Okay, so I have numerous size beakers. I do not get my readings directly from these. I end up pouring the water into these to get a more accurate milliliter reading. So I am going to put it in this one, okay? So what is the purpose of this? Well, basically, I'm gonna add a known volume, which is gonna be my initial volume, my V0. And it'll be in milliliters. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fill this up with water, dump it in once, twice, three. I'll probably put in, as you can see here, even though it's not that accurate, it's a rough estimate, I'm probably gonna put in half a liter just so I can get this thing totally submerged. I could probably get away with four if I put it that way. Because once I, yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll put in about 400 milliliters of water, okay? And then once I put the rock in, it should, I'll do 450 to be sure. It's going to displace it up here. But before I take my rock out, <laughs> I need to draw a line where that is okay, where that water was displaced. So I'm gonna add the appropriate amount of water to get it up to that line. And I am going to slowly remeasure all of that water and get my V1, all right? And my V0, my initial, is going to be less than my V1 will be. So I will subtract my 
V0 from my V1, and that will get me my delta V or my change. Okay, and that's the number I'm going to use. I'm going to use delta V, and that will end up being this number. So technically, for my measurement, I'm going to use to divide by my mass, which is this, because that isn't going to change at all, will be my delta V. So I need to take other measurements first, volume initial, which will be in milliliters. Like I said, it's probably going to be 450, but I might freak out and end up doing 500. My V1 is also going to be in milliliters. And my delta V, V delta, is going to be equal to my V1 minus my V0. And that will also be in milliliters. That's just to show you that's how delta V is calculated. It's simple. It doesn't get much simpler than this. This is like grade six maths here. All right, so I'm gonna run the test and I will plug in the numbers for you. Okay, as you can see here, I have added my initial volume of water, my V initial, which was actually 478.5 milliliters. All right, so that's my V initial. Now, what do you do from here? I take this, it's dry, it has to be dry. You can get it wet a little bit if it's porous. This isn't porous, it's pretty crystalline, so I'm not worried about air bubbles. But I need to set it in here as gently as I can. So you have to make sure it, your initial amount of water will totally submerge your object. So I'm going to put that in there, trying to get as little as possible of water on my hands. Now I am going to simply take a dry erase marker and I am going to go. Now, when a beaker this big, you don't have to worry about measuring from the bottom of the meniscus so much. You just have to be consistent. About that's my line. And according to this, you can see it's really close to 550 milliliters. But just to get a confirmation over here, I'm gonna do this here. It's good there. Okay, so I have two lines. I can do this from. Now I'm going to take my rock out, my minerals, oxymetals. There were a couple bubbles, but nothing that should be a big deal. Shake off as much as I can. All right, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fill my water up to here as good as I can to those lines. All right, then I'm gonna take that, empty it back into these because they're far more accurate than this thing so I can get my V1. Okay, I've added water. I have not moved my container. I don't want to move my container because that might alter my lines. This table's pretty level, but it is not perfect. I'm sticking my fingers in there to remove stuff on the side. I do have paper towels. I'll do that here in a second. I just don't want it, and it did in the corner. I just didn't want it to drip down. Um, okay, so I've got my v1 now i need to measure it i could take it right from here but that's not going to be that accurate this is a huge beaker so i'm going to pour it in here and count my 100 milliliters and whatever is left over add it up to get my v1 okay i'm getting pressed for time here but here's my initial volume here is the displacement volume here's the difference that's going to be my delta v i have not calculated it yet hopefully this I did good. Hopefully I got it relatively close. So we already have our initial volume there. So our V1 is 548.5. So our delta V, subtracting the two as you just saw, is exactly 70.0 milliliters. So now what do I do? In order to get my density, I divide by my mass, 189.4 grams divided by 70, technically that zero is significant, milliliters, which I just drop the milliliter for this, because they're equal, so I can use centimeters cubed, which is going to equal my density. So let's put that into the calculator and see what that gives us. Ah, talk about hitting a nail on the head. I get two, 0 0.705 
five seven which is approximately because I'm taking the four because of that top one which is approximately equal to but honestly I can't be any more confident than this no units cancel so they both need to be in my answer which is exactly what my density is so my density is really 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 close to calcite I mean I'm dead on I mean, that isn't much higher than that up there. And it's a still, you know, it's a lot closer to the uh, calcite than it is the dolomite. Talk about hitting the nail on the head. I was not expecting to be that accurate. I tried as much as I could. That creeps me out. The Winky's blowing that door open. Hear it? Anyway, let me go close that. <clears throat> Okay, there are margins of error associated with this, and I will probably run the test several more times to confirm this. Best way to get that is to run this test several more times while I have the temperature consistent at that and to develop a margin of error. And that way I can confirm, confirm that the majority of that rock is calcite. I actually expected it to be more like uh, 2.75 because of that quartz bottom but then I got to thinking I'm like oh yeah <laughs> quartz is actually less dense than calcite quartz's density is about 2.65 so quartz is even lower so there are some impurities in this we obviously know we have some impurities in our specimen which is still wet we know we have some impurities because our most hardness is slightly lower than ideal calcite and our density is really close to calcite but we know we have quartz but outside of margins of error it's not unrealistic at all for what we're doing i wanted to do this so i could show you without any actual like you know detailed petrographic analysis how you can identify stuff like this and i am probably going to wrap this up here so i'm going to do a quick summary and then I'm going to do some more density tests and actually record this in my present field book. You guys have seen the, I mean, and record this in my present lab book. You guys have seen the old one, which was this one, which took me about a year to fill. And I'm currently filling this one. This is my geo lab books. And I will put the information in there and I will give my neighbors their crystal back as much as I don't want to. Okay, before I wrap this up, I just wanted to show you this real quick because I said I would mention it. I'm going to talk real quick about the crystal shape. Now, there was another key clue that I really didn't talk about, but it was like first thing I noticed that looking under hand lens is that the brown crystals grade eight, or maybe I did mention it. Anyway, they grade eight into this lighter, whiter, whiter stuff. So you, you look close, probably, I don't know how well you can see it on the camera probably can't but the brown crystals grade eight into the white so that's a key indicator that they're the same mineral um, there's no resting upon now when you get to the shell there is you can tell there's no gradation or very little gradation between the shell and the white calcite the shell has got a slight grayish tint to it the one i'm calling white calcite is slight yellow tint to it but i wanted to mention the crystals really quick Because there's one more thing I wanted to show you. Now, hexagonal crystals, hexagonal crystal system has a lot of different habits, if you will. I'm just going to use that word. It doesn't always form the nice prism crystals that you think of when you think of quartz or amethyst or stuff like that. That is very common, especially with quartz. But quartz, calcite, these things can also be Jersey bowl and all that kind of thing or have no crystal structure like this does or this the shell probably does have a crystalline structure It's just microscopic In mineralogy crystal system is based on relationships of your a B and C axes. It's not based off of actual shape Okay, and it's always the simplest crystal system in particular when you look at these, I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. Well, I might take a picture of it just to, so you see. These are rhombohedral penetration twins. I knew just from experience instantly, instantly looking at this, that we had twinned crystals. Some are not twinned, like over here, they're um, rhombohedral. 
and they show cleavage on those facies, but they're buried so much I can't really tell what direction it is. Uh, you can use things, more complicated things like cleavage direction, stuff like that, and fracture, stuff like that to determine what mineral it is. I didn't do that here because there's no need to. Uh, and plus, it would have been a lecture for another time. So, we had a pretty simple simple way of identifying this. When you dump acid on it, it fizzes, it pretty much tells you it's carbonate in it, unquestionably. Right? Weak HCl acid like that. So, we have these rhombohedral penetration twins throughout here. This, the uh, what I call the white base, is pretty much granular calcite, and then I would call this microcrystalline quartz. So basically, in a nutshell, this is what we had. We had our tests conducted. If I left any out, I'll add them later. We did optical, and there were two tests kind of in there. It, it iridesced, and it was opaque. We had color, which is over there, too. We did a long wave UV. We did cold dilute hydrochloric acid. We did scratch hardness test, same thing, streak test, and a density test. And our three defining minerals, which just generically using color, brown, white base, and white shell, our brown is golden calcite. That brown calcite is referred to often as brown calcite or golden calcite, even though it's dark like this. So you can call that, I would just call it brown calcite. We have our white base, which is calcite, the granular calcite. And then we have our white shell, which is that white, slightly gray tinted quartz there. That's microcrystalline. But anyway, that's it. I think I've babbled enough. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, feel I left something out, please leave them below. And I hope you learned something.